Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Thanks for coming on the podcast, James. How are you? It's great to be here, Michael. I'm looking forward to this session where we're going to dig into what storytelling is all about. Yeah, I'm well, fellow storyteller, I'm it's I'm in my element to be able to share storytelling with a fellow storytelling, which is really, really great. And thanks for reaching out and, and coming on the podcast. Um, and, and as you know, I explained to you when we communicated, I tend to reserve this podcast. And I'm just saying this for the listeners, um, for small business owners, mm-hmm. uh, you're a bit unusual. You work for a large corporate, but because the topic is storytelling, which is my passion too, um, I'm making a massive exception for you to be on the podcast because because I know our listeners will absolutely enjoy and love this topic as well. So thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Well, I think uh, although I do work for a large company, I work for SAP, big computer company, yeah. a lot of the skills that I have uh, tried to uh, to teach others and have tried to develop myself, I think relate to anybody in all, all walks of life, whether that's small businessman. Large, large business person, or even in our own personal lives. I mean, let's face it, storytelling uh, is the basis for all communication. Um, but agree. I'll give you a quote, quote from my minister at church, and he says that uh, storytelling is the only way to communicate deep truths. And I like that term, deep truths. If you want to really change someone's mind or really get across a point of view that's important to you, mm. then a standard PowerPoint slide or even a white paper isn't really going to cut it. And if you look at, no. really, I look at sort of the great persuaders, uh, which are often politicians and religious leaders, uh, they, they communicate via stories almost exclusively. Like they don't yes. use other, other written props. They don't use PowerPoint. Um, and so no. they, seem quite, they seem to be quite effective in, in changing people's minds or motivating people. And so I think that's a skill that anybody can learn to develop. And so I've been trying to figure out what, what that means in the world of business. But I think the, the, the things that you're developing and that I'm studying are relevant to anybody uh, in all walks of life. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so talking about that then, um, we'd like to get started, if that's okay with you, for us to learn a little bit more about you and your story. So we'd like to find out where were you born? Have you moved around? Tell us about your education, your career, and then how we got or how you got to where you are today. And then we, we can do a deep dive into your role today at SAP and how storytelling fits in with what you're doing. Is that okay? That's fine. Um, okay, so over to you. I mean, for career highlights, look at my LinkedIn profile. We'll send the link out afterwards. But as you said, so yes. I use the term the story arc. Um, so when you're introducing yourself, particularly in business, people do, as you asked, Michael, want to know well, where did you, why did you end up here and why is that relevant? Um, you can't yes. just sort of parachute into a meeting. People want to understand, so what's he all about? What's his game? And so, so when we do, do, when I try to teach how to introduce yourself, I use this idea of you, you have to explain enough about your career that justifies why people should pay attention to you right now. Um, yes. So you know, I'm English, you can tell that, and that um, you know, grew up in England, but uh, I did move to California uh, uh, in my, my job with computers um, in the early 90s when the internet was just taking off, really. Um, yes. And it was for a six-month gig. And, you know, 12 and a half years later with a wife and two kids, I eventually moved back to the UK. Right. Um, and so these are, these are moving uh, within my company. And so, so my, what I actually do is, is uh, in, in, in the computer world, it's called pre-sales, which is uh, how you explain to companies uh, what the solution is supposed to do. Um, whether yes. that's uh, you know, a complicated piece of software or, or uh, an implementation. And so at some point, the customer needs to be persuaded that, that your company and the solution you provide is going to solve their business problem. And that's, quite frankly, it's a fundamental part of any sale uh, yes. is whether you're putting in a new bathroom or putting in the new computer system, the NHS, at some point, you or a team of you has to persuade the customer or potential customer that it's going to work and here's how it's going to work and you're going to be successful. And anyway, yes. that, that, in this world, it's called pre-sales. And sometimes that's demonstrating the software. Sometimes it's doing a business case. Sometimes it's doing a technical white paper. But as I, as I developed this, I changed covers a few times, I sort of came across the insight that actually the idea of a story was what we were all trying to do. Uh, and this is, yes. this is before, quite frankly, storytelling took off and became a, yes. like a buzzword and lots of books were written about it and all that kind of guff. Mm-hmm. And so I actually, and I've had this... Um, the feeling that there was a lot of skills that were common 
uh, across the different companies I worked at, which was we were all trying to explain you know, what was going to happen. And, and the medium of a story was better than, uh, and I'm sure you may be aware, in the corporate world, PowerPoint is king. Um, and so, but yes. I was finding that that a, a, the metaphor of a story um, was a, a better way to explain. And so I ran my first class, which was called How to Tell a Story. This is in the mid 2000s, when again, no one was mm. talking about storytelling. And it was based actually on the parable of the Good Samaritan and analyzing why that was an effective story, why Jesus told it, and how we could do the same kind of a thing in our, in our business world. And mm. um, I, yeah, I, I moved around a bit. And this idea of storytelling was the only part of my job that I actually felt was transferable. Uh, when you make, change companies, you know, the technology yes. changes, the customer changes, everything changes. But this idea of, hey, I can teach people how to tell a story, I then use it several other companies uh, throughout my career. Um, and now suddenly everyone's talking about storytelling. Crikey, even any marketing executives, we change their LinkedIn profile, say, I'm a storyteller. Um, yes. So um, that's fine. Uh, I'm glad that my evangelism has paid off, not seriously. But um, uh, well, anyway, <laughs> what I've found over the last few years is there's a, there's a whole corpus of knowledge around this. There are books, there are podcasts like yours, there are practitioners. And uh, sh- slowly but surely, uh, sorry, slowly but surely, our um, uh, even our corporates are changing the way that they communicate, and even governments. So when governments are mm. trying to communicate yeah. something important like COVID, I think they're starting to use the idea of storytelling. Um, well, yes. let me put it this way. When they try to use graphs and, and PowerPoints, it doesn't work so well as when they try no. to explain a story. And uh, uh, we see this in all parts of our lives that if someone tells you a story, um, you're much more likely to pay attention than, and unfortunately, the, the, the raw data. That can work you know, positive and negative. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I mean, it's a really good example in terms of government communication, um, because it, it goes both ways, doesn't it? Because the story often is a negative story, <laughs> and they want to try and spin a positive story over a negative situation very often to try and persuade people that it's. It's, it's different in business versus government, I think, because government are always kind of swimming upstream against negativity and they're having yeah. to persuade people that actually there is a positive story here, albeit the data is showing a negative story. And therefore it becomes really, really tricky for, the, for them to convince us that it's a positive story. Yeah, you see it in, in, in health, health communication. So a few years ago, the government analysed uh, how stroke patients uh, could survive better. And it turns out that the data in other countries prove that it's best to have a comparatively small number of centres that are specifically good at managing stroke and then take ambulances to those you know, specific uh, hospitals. Yes. And that means closing the smaller stroke centres in other hospitals. Well, it turns out that trying to close anything in a hospital is, is a political uh, political time bomb. Right? Everyone says, hey, close my hospital. But even if you can try to prove through data that the health outcomes are likely to be better, it's still very difficult to overcome the emotion of, they're closing my hospital. Um, and mm. that, that policy was very, very hard to roll out. Um, and so any any policy where the number of uh, you know, gainers is, comp- is large, but by a small amount, but the number of losers is small, but by a large amount, is very difficult for politicians to, to get yes. across. Uh, you see yeah. that in all sorts of tax policy or government policy and so on. So I don't have an answer for that. No. And, in, in, and I guess in business, especially, I mean, you were saying you've moved, taken storytelling in all the different companies that you've yeah. been in. And presumably, well, let me ask a question. Were some of those company, companies, when you switched, were they competition previously to you? Or were they just um, so kind of different? Not, not quite competition to, to me, but they were competition to my customers. So I, I worked for, first I started working for a company that helped companies buy things. And I changed yes. to help work for companies that help companies sell things. So in some ways they sort of competed. But um, yeah. it's still the ultimate idea that, you know, in, in, in any, whether you're a small business person or a large business person, some part of your life is trying to win customers or to keep customers that you've got. And so being able to explain carefully, you know, what it is supposed to be happening is important. So one of the, one of the things that is often happens is the real decision maker is not the person you're speaking to. So a very small mm-hmm. case might be, you know, you're trying to get, uh, you're a business person, you're a builder, and you're trying to get a contract for a small house extension, and you're speaking to, you know, the person you're dealing with maybe you know, one of the householders but the 
the householder's partner may actually be the decision maker. You don't actually know that. You don't get to speak yeah. to them. But if you can tell the story of, well, another of my customers had this, and here's what we did, and here was the outcome. We had this problem and overcame it, and here's why I was able to do that. If you can package that up, into a story, it's quite likely that it will be communicated to the other decision maker who's not in the yeah. room. Whereas if you just gave them a fact sheet or just gave them a quote or just gave them a, hey, a great price, it, it wouldn't have the same impact as if you wrapped up your message in a story. And this idea that the story, we've proved this throughout civilization, is the quantum of information that can be transmitted. Um, and so it's, it's put together in a certain way that it can be passed from person A to person B, which in business is very important because person B made the decision maker that you're not in front of. I always think there's a, there's a song in the musical Hamilton that goes, you've got to be in the room where it happens. Mm. Well, in business, you're often not in that meeting. You know, that yeah. might be some board of directors meeting or something else and you're not in it. Um, but uh, your PowerPoint won't be in it. Uh, your business case might not be in it. They may not be able to explain the technology. But if you told a story and told it well, yeah, then that might be in it. So you get to have your your deep truth, as I called it, in that meeting that you're not in. And that's power. That's really powerful that you can get into locked rooms uh, through a story. Yeah. And, I mean, I, do you feel... Well, what's your, let me ask a different question. What's your experience been in the companies that you've been in where you've evangelized around storytelling in terms of people's acceptance of it? So there's a couple of, couple of things. So, so one is the good news about storytelling is it's not really a new skill. It's a skill that everybody had, but a lot of people forgot. Yes. Uh, so when we go home to our children, we're all natural storytellers. Um, yes. Even down to when, when our children, we catch them perhaps in, a, in an untruth or a lie. We don't say, don't lie. We say, let me tell you about the boy, little boy, little shepherd boy. And he was out looking at the field, looking after his sheep one day. And he, as a joke, he would cry, wolf, wolf. And let me tell you what happened to that little boy. And we, we yes. all know this story. And this is how we communicate deep truths. Uh, in this example about, you know, you've got to be trusted, don't lie. Uh, through the medium of the story. And that's a natural thing for us to do. We don't think that's a weird thing. Or we're no. down the pub with our mates. Hey, let me tell you what happened to old so-and-so yesterday. And we naturally go into the storytelling. Nothing, nothing particularly new about this. No. So there's, there's a cultural thing as it sometimes seems to be not professional, um, which is a strange thing. Um, but yeah. also, you know, this idea that it's something that's been forgotten uh, and just needs to be relearned. Um, so that's, that's one observation. The other is, is it's part of something yeah. that, that we, about any kind of, uh, growth in people, especially, as I say, you know, you tell my, my hat covering my bald head that I mean, as I politely put it, the second half of my career. Uh, and so there's a temptation that you adopt a fixed mindset about what you're good at. Uh, mm. I've been successful doing A, B and C, and this is how I do it. And so when someone says, actually, maybe you should try something different, um, there's a natural resistance to that. And so you have to adopt a growth mindset that mm -hmm. skills, skills can be learned. People learn this technique. Here's how they learn it. Here, there's, a, there's a way to do it. You don't magically wake, wake up and learn to play the guitar. No, you go lessons and you listen to podcasts and you have, you have a, a book and whatever, and you learn slowly to play the guitar. You don't just say, oh, I'm not, I can never do that. So this is true with any business skill, but, but sometimes people in our said, second half of our careers, we're, we're yes. more, more of a fixed mindset. And that's been part of the, the, the challenge to overcome that. Yeah. And, um, I suppose people are always looking for evidence, aren't they? They're saying, because if you if if you were to look at TV, mm -hmm. and you know lots of programs have got ads in between, I'm always evaluating them. It's I can't help it, and look at it and go, is that good storytelling or isn't it? And there are very few ads that I pick out and go that one will really stick with me because it's a good story you know they don't need to say any words at all there and the story is giving me all the information that i need and i will remember it and so i was i was because you i mean you mentioned what well, everyone now knows storytelling you know and everyone's using it and it's now kind of but a lot of people are doing it, but 
are, try, are trying to do it. They're doing it badly. So how do you, it's a long question I'm trying to formulate here, but in essence, what I'm trying to get out of you is in your business experience with be it clients or even the people internally where there's been yeah. some resistance, how have you been able to convince them that the data is really confirming that storytelling works? So this is the thing. When you're trying to persuade people of storytelling, uh, you're basically saying stories are better than data. So the way that you convince people about storytelling is not to use data, because then you then uh, have just pronounced your own argument. Um, yes. So, so the best the best way to prove that storytelling is better than data is to tell stories about storytelling or meta storytelling. Um, and so, so a few things of that is so one is um, you know when I teach classes or whatever, I have a lot of examples, um, and I can tell from people's uh, you know uh, reactions and how they're interfacing, even remotely, that they yes. find it more engaging than the typical corporate communication okay that's that's and, and I, I turn around and point out to them that you know the first time i have every eye on me for 20 minutes and i challenge someone when was that last happened in the powerpoint um so that's yes. that's one thing and then i do have um anecdotal stories about stories so i i go back to my being in the room where it happens uh comment uh, okay yes. says michael do you have an example yes i do um mm. so i do have an example of i told a story uh, which I've told several times. I'm not going to go into it now, but it involves me losing my passport and and, and so on. And it's a story about about myself. Uh, and at the end, it talks about how we uh, apply for passports and so on. But um, it's a nice little story, and it makes the point. Um, and I told it in a customer meeting, um, and I didn't think much of it. I tell it a lot. Uh, but I learned later on, six months later, that, that story itself. And he just said, "Oh, that passport story thing was told in a meeting I wasn't in." Uh, and that customer did end up buying the service that we were selling. Uh, now, I don't say it was necessarily down to that one thing, but it does prove that the message, which was an important business message about how companies communicate, was transmitted, the deep truth was transmitted into a meeting I wasn't in. Um, and I, yeah. I challenged I challenged the people, how, and how else could I have done that with a nice PowerPoint? I don't think so. So no. um, I think storytelling successes will only ever be stories. Um, so... Uh, I, I'm generally, as we're saying about, you know, government communications, you know, people are not wired to listen to data. Yeah. Uh, it is not, I mean, human evolution, uh, we are, our brains are designed to observe other people and to, to learn from them. I always think about, you know, if you were um, some, uh, on the savannah in our pre-civilization days, uh, and you're observing uh, how other people, Groups are successful and where the bushes are and, and how to avoid the lions. You're, you're telling stories. You're not empirically running experiments, um, which would suggest that's what, what data uh, would, would require yeah. you to do. Uh, and of course, this has, you know, some can have poor effects as well. People make poor health decisions based on stories, not on data. That's an example where it doesn't work very well. So mm. in, in healthcare, you do want to have data. But um, where, um, where you're engaging with people, uh, storytelling is a natural um, method. In fact, I was watching on TV, a TV show we have here in the UK called Baptiste, and he made this comment that, you know, people are more willing to change their mind when they're in storytelling receiving mode rather than when they're in, in hypercritical data analysis mode. Uh, so by engaging someone in a story and engaging them emotionally, they're closer to being persuaded than if you present a whole bunch of numbers, which are hard to understand. Um, so... Yeah. Um, I, I obviously 100% agree with you. And at the same time, I can, I, I see evidence every single day of, you will see it as well on LinkedIn and many other places yes. where everybody is still, let's call it just advertising. You know, the advertising industry on social may media is making billions and TV still as well. But I think the internet's probably overtaken TV by now, uh, or it won't be very long before they do, but people are still in advertising mode, presenting features, maybe a few benefits, but it's about, you know, this is me, look at me, buy me, you know, look at me, buy me. And this is the message that's coming out all the time. So in, in your world, have you seen that change? Yes, I have. Um, 
I think, you know, in my world, we still have complicated, complicated stuff. It's hard to understand. Uh, it's mm. hard to understand how it could affect the potential customer's business and what the impact yes. might be. So in, in that respect, I mean, it, it's a hoary old chestnut from you know, the 1960s. People buy from people. You can learn that in your first ever sales conversation. Yes. And so, so there, is, there is a very much in, in sales, which is my background, there's very much this idea that you need to engage with people personally. Um, yeah. And so the, the good news is that's um, you know, already ingrained, you know, and the salespeople are naturally people that like people and they want people, the people, they're, they're kind of people who want them to like them too. So, yes. um, so it, they are already halfway along the journey. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a good start. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have seen uh, a lot of change over there. I mean, the, the, and you talk about social media and LinkedIn, uh, Michael, you know, this word influencer, which is a word mm. I, I'm not sure I quite know. Are we, are we influenced? I don't know what it even means, quite frankly. But, mm. um, mm. uh, but the idea that, that which is uh, a, new, a new idea on social media, but it's, it's encapsulating this idea that uh, people buy from people that they trust. And, they yes. approve, and these are people who are uh, not coming up, as you said, with a bunch of data or a bunch of features, but they're they're explaining uh, through stories uh, the impact of this this service would have or, or, or the product and, and so on. Which is why uh, a good example is, I mean, um, on uh, we all you know look at Expedia for uh, for travel or something rather similar. Um, and yes. remember, in the old days, hotels used to have stars, right? Two star, three star, four star. Yes, kind of stuff, right. Yeah. I mean. When my parents were looking at holidays, they would say, we only ever stay in three stars, right? Because four stars, two, two flash, and, and you know, two, right. two stars, no good enough, right? So that was there. Now, who believes star ratings? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Everybody immediately scrolls down to the comments, even though yes. you know that those comments can be gamed and there can be you know, all sorts of ways why they may not be that truthful or whatever. And we, you know, we understand that. It's impossible not to read them. right? So anytime you book anywhere, you have yes. to look at the comments. And even though it's one guy, he has a similar sized family and they went at the similar time of year and you know, wow. I mean, that's, that's good information. Right. And yes. it's really hard to not relate to that. Whereas the guff at the top, which is the hotel's description and maybe a professional reviewer, we really don't care about that anymore. So yeah. I think this idea that we are very much uh, influenced by what other people say, um, uh, we, we already, we, we always have done, but I think in business now it's become more formalized. And so I care. A marketer would say we need to control that conversation uh, is, 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 is a way of saying, you know, what we want to understand what people say about our product or service. Um, so we can yeah. you know, uh, you know, yeah. try to influence that. I, I, I have this um, theory that I, I have become more sceptical about social media in with that regard. Mm -hmm. So... I've become skeptical because I can see I can see that word manipulation, you know, where people are starting to manipulate the conversation or the narrative to persuade people, convince them, uh, you know, hoodwink them into believing that a product or service is the best that there is to be got. And yeah, if enough people write about it, talk about it jump on the bandwagon, um, then everyone, you know, like the reviews on TripAdvisor, uh, people are going to believe it and go, well, it must be true because that person who I don't know has just written about it. So it must be true. And so I've, I've, you know, for, for example, uh, I, I, have not got a healthy regard for Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> from the basis that he turned around and said, we do not sell your data, which is a complete fabrication. I won't even say lie, because if the data wasn't there, the advertisers couldn't present you their information. They have to rely on our data in mm -hmm. order to present us with adverts. Um, so it's kind of a shame that the social media world has become this medium where people are believing the stories. And therefore, it's becoming harder, I believe, to convince people of credible stories. Um, 
if I'm a skeptic now, why isn't more, probably more people are being skeptical? So can you see where I'm going with that? How do we get over that skepticism? So I'm, I'm not an expert on, on social media. And obviously, there is a wide variety of viewpoints on that. I'm generally optimistic um, right. on, Good. on how it uh, improves uh, our communication with people. Hey, I met you because of social media. Yes. Right? We would not be having this conversation if uh, I hadn't read your podcast on LinkedIn and reached out to you via something else. Yes. Um, so we, and, you know, on Twitter as well. So we've communicated on three mm. media already. Um, yes. So, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not doing much travel these days. So the, the ability to uh -huh. meet new people uh, through social media channels, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, the ones I use, um, this, this podcast itself is, a, is a, a good outcome of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm generally, you know, not, not negative about these mm. things. Um, and I think people do uh, have a degree of skepticism about social media naturally. Um, so I, I, I don't worry too much about that. Obviously, there's other issues around echo chambers and so on. But um, yes. I want to focus really more on on what we see in uh, in business. And so I think uh, if you're a, a small business, being able to talk confidently about what your customers are doing, uh, I think is a is a really critical skill, and be able to gather those stories. So maybe you think you don't have time uh, or you don't know enough because you outsource the implementation to somebody else or, or whatever. Um, this is where uh, manufacturers struggle with retailers. So, so manufacturers, but you, you manufacture of, I don't know, uh, a shower unit. For, uh, you don't know who actually buys it right? because it goes no. to, a to a retailer. And so is the pressure that you spent so long figuring out, is that actually working the way you wanted it? Or is it too hard or too soft? And is the temperature unit actually coming on fast enough? It's very hard to get that kind of feedback. And so yes. any way that I can get feedback from the person actually using my product is, is really valuable. And so, you know, um, we call this one experience management, which is, can you find the end user of your product or service and get information from them, taking out all of the intermediaries who may have actually sold it or serviced it or added to it or whatever. Yes. Um, and that's challenging. Um, I always wondered when I first moved to the States, you'd buy a computer or something and in it, there'd be a little card saying, send this in. And you'll get, you know, ten pounds off the ten dollars off the price of your printer. You think, well, that's dumb. Why don't you just knock it off the, the price of the printer? So because the manufacturer puts that in, and they, they that tells you right there that the, the knowledge of who you are, your name and address is worth ten dollars because they're going to give you ten dollars in a check if you tell them who you are and fill out a little card. Um, and so, you know, that's a pre-social media, but it shows the value of you as a consumer of information to the. Um, to the manufacturer in that example, and it's actually monetized. You can see it. Well, they're willing to pay ten dollars for this um, because without yeah. that, they wouldn't know who actually bought their print. Um, so, so I, I use the idea Good that point. we we need to uh, we need to listen for stories. So that's sort of story mining, um, and then we need to refine those stories so they can be told perhaps shorter, um, yeah. more more entertaining, perhaps more humorous, or more or anyway, put in it, put encapsulated so they can be retold. And then we need to be storytellers. Like, so if you like the, the metaphor I use is this mine, the refinery, and the stage are the three uh, competencies um, on storytelling. A lot of time, this middle piece, the refining of the story is skipped over. And so we end up just being tape recorders of, well, he said this, so I'll say it to him. Well, hang on. Yes. That's, you know, uh, comedians and people who write movie scripts and so on, that's not what they do. Right? They no. refine the script to be just right. I always think about American uh, TV uh, comic programs like uh, Seinfeld or Frasier or, or Friends, all those things. And you, mm. the way that this, the jokes are structured, you can imagine a group of 20 people like refining it. And they're not quite like that. Oh, don't say that. Yeah, oh, oh, that. yeah, that's it. And so they're really sort of super refined. And when it comes out, it feels like a refined joke that's had a lot of you know, work put on it. Yes. Um, the British style is a little more off the wall. Right. So some guy just talks um, and it's less scripted and it feels different. And some of the jokes could go completely flat and others are the funniest thing ever because they, yes. they, they're much more raw. Um, yeah. So storytelling and business, I think this refining thing is important uh, because, as I said, we're trying to get our stories told on. Mm. Um, and so so why do jokes work? Because they can be encapsulated into something simple enough that they can be told. Uh, and if they're rambling mm. or duplicated or you miss bits out, the joke doesn't work. No. Um, and so customer stories need to have that, that refinement uh, so they can be retold. 
Uh, I, I love that. And it's it's something that I haven't come across. So thank you for that. I, I think the refining part, I can see how that plays a, a massive part. And I, I can see, you know, where people do it and where people don't do it. <laughs> so yeah, brilliant. I love that. I love that. So one of the things that you mentioned to me before kind of in a, in our communication was metaphors. You're quite mm. a fan of metaphors, aren't you? Could you yeah, explain so metaphors a bit more about are, they're, that? They're a type of story. They may have a lot of similarities, right? They're designed, they're encapsulated, they're designed to be retold. Um, and so, you know, I, a lot of us sell services that are somewhat intangible. Um, you know, so if you say you're an influencer marketer, well, I mean, what, what is that? Um, or yeah. I, I sell, you know, software that helps companies buy things or, or in their supply chain. What, what does that really mean? Yeah. Um, so being able to, to translate the intangible to the tangible uh, uh, through a metaphor is something that it makes a lot of sense. Metaphors are just like they are stories. Really. I mean, they, they are um, sort of saying, well, you don't really understand that. Let me move you to a different frame of reference. We understand that now. And now look at the outcome of that. Let's go back to where we started. So the sort of the sort of aha moment. So. Um, so one, I've got, I've got lots of these. I, I document them. I teach them out. And I, that's, when I run a, a training class, I usually start every every one with what I call story of the week, which is a new metaphor to explain something that we sell. And yes. so um, I have a structure for this as well. So it's, it starts off that first of all, um, you should try to, to change the energy in the room somehow. So, so, so remotely, oftentimes we have PowerPoints. I suggest at this point, turn your PowerPoint off and suddenly, whoa, your face is big on the screen. So you've already you've, you've changed the temperature. And yes. of course, people like people, right? So we look at eyes, right? We look at faces. Mm. Um, you know, you, we've heard the story that, you know, a, a baby coming out of the, of the womb can recognize a mother within the first 90 seconds or something. Yes. Um, so our brains are actually physically wired to recognize faces. I think that's yeah. the research on that. And I always say, and we're not wired to recognize PowerPoint. So, um, <laughs> you know, faces are naturally attractive to look at. We like looking at faces. You know, what are people yes. wearing? How are they looking? How old are they? What do they look like? How, what's their face? Are they happy or sad? So, you know, we're naturally wired to look at faces. So that's the first thing I always remind people. If you have a PowerPoint up, if, you know, turn it off and suddenly, whoa, you're suddenly big on the screen. That, that gets people. In a real room, as you know, you, you, you would, um, you know, turn off a projector or go to a different side of the room or you know, take my hat off, take my glasses off. I used to do that sometimes to get people's attention. So I mean, that's the first thing is, is you've entered sort of storytelling mode and in the sort of corporate world, there's a lot of you know, standard ways of communicating. Okay, here's the PowerPoint with the, with the meeting and here's the PowerPoint with the agenda and now speaking yeah. number one. Everyone kind of gets in the group and suddenly you're breaking the, the standard way of presenting. So people are more open. And so you yeah. there's, there's something different that engages them to receive differently. Oh, well, Okay, it sounds like it might be a story. So I call this kind of once upon a time. So in, in, with our children, if you say once upon a time, which doesn't actually mean anything at all, really, it basically says, hey, this is a story. So yes. get in story receiving mode because uh, it's not, an, it's, you know, and so people sort of, ah, so they visibly relax. You can even see this sometimes on Zoom. When you do something like this, they, go, ah. they, they actually move away from the screen and they sort of sit more comfortably because yeah. Oh, it's just, I don't want to ask anything. It's not going to be too complicated. I don't have to do anything. I'll just no. listen to this. I'll just listen. So that's, the, yeah. that's the first thing. And then I say there's often some background to explain. Um, and then the key thing is, is that the best metaphors are personal. Um, so they have mm. some personal element to them. So I, I tell a story about, as you can imagine, in computer software, Michael, a lot of things have to, steps have to be done in the right order. It has to be integrated is the term that we use. So if yes. you take an order from the customer, it needs to go to the factory and then be built and then be sent to distribution and then, then you receive the money. So it has to be integrated. So that's an important idea. Mm. And so I have two stories along this, along this that talk about this. So rather than just saying it needs to be integrated because it's a word that doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. Um, you know, well, what's a metaphor? Okay, so I have two. So one is the relay race. So I went yes. to the Rio Olympics uh, five years ago now, and I saw the four by 100 meter relay. Um, I was great, fantastic. I love the relay events. Like, it's so Amazing. exciting because, yeah. because the, the runners who win the relay race are not the fastest runners, right? No. They're often the people who've worked more on the interchange. And the, the, yep. the, the countries that have very fast runners, like Jamaica or America or even Britain, they don't get together very much to practice their relay because they're all too busy in their individual events and getting medals yes. on that. But in the, yeah. in, the, in the Rio Olympics, the Japanese, who have no fast runners, right? They focus yeah. on the relay. I focus on the relay, and they're not that fast. But they, because they spent so much time on the interchange of the baton, 
they got the silver medal, right? And I remember watching, like, who are, they, who are these guys, right? Um, and so they got the silver medal, right? Four guys who don't, I still can't remember. Um, because they had focused on the interchange. Right? And then here's the aha moment. The same is true in business. You don't have to have the best order entry system or the best shipping system or the best cash receiving system. The important thing is that you focus on the interchange between them. The baton is passed successfully from one of the others because you yeah. know that if you yeah. drop the baton, it's game over. So that's a simple example of a metaphor uh, to yeah. get across the idea of how important this concept of integration is, which is kind of arcane and intangible, mm. but it's told through this metaphor. And again, because I was, I was there, I have a picture that I took from the top bend of the relay race. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, that, I'll tell you that story. I've got the ticket. In fact, if I, if I was at home, um, I would show you the ticket, um, <laughs> which actually I deliberately kept just, just for this, to be able to flash to the screen. Another way to get people's attention is to have props around you. Yeah. Um, so that's an example of a metaphor. You could argue is it a story or a metaphor. I use the term metaphor because it's, it's taking something like integration, which has these capabilities, and it's yes. mapping it to a story that has the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then you go, the answer is, you don't want to drop the baton in the relay race. Well, guess what? In business, mm. you don't want to drop the baton as well. So you yeah. transfer to the story, tell the story, get the outcome, and transfer it back to the point you're making. So that's why metaphors, I think, work work really well. I, I, I they work extremely well because you had me sitting in the stadium, looking at the track, looking at the Japanese handover for the baton being super slick. And not only that, because in my old days, when I worked in corporate life, we did something which you may remember called TQM, um, mm -hmm. which was of course originated by Edward Deming uh, uh, yeah. in Japan, yep. because the USA wouldn't take it on board. So he took it to Japan and they mastered it. So when you said the Japanese runners I immediately went to Edward Deming and all the practices the Japanese know about perfecting something, making small, tiny improvements. So I can imagine the practicing that they were yeah. doing, <laughs> you know, getting these tiny improvements to get better and better and better at passing over the baton uh, to the next runner for and the great thing to is, Mike, win a medal. And the great thing is, Michael, is that this, this story which I've told many, many times, and Rio was five years ago now, for instance, it's just got better today because no yes. one else has actually had that insight uh, mm. to say, oh, it's like TQM or, or Kanban yeah. or Kaizen or whatever, uh, any other yeah. Japanese business pra practice. And now when I tell the story, if I had you know, about, about longer, longer time, I would say, you know what, my uh, friend Michael, he actually had this insight. And so now your insight about this story, which I've told many, many times, yes. uh, has an additional piece on the end Mm. Um, uh, and so you become part of the story, yeah. uh, which, you know, so and it, that itself uh, gives the story more power because mm. uh, Michael DeGroote, like, he, he's a professional storyteller and he said this, <laughs> right? So, you know, it, suddenly he, he the, the story uh, has more power because it's mm. not just something that I think of, but, you know, it, it has a corpus of knowledge that, that goes with it. Uh, so the great thing about, about stories is you know, they develop. However, if, if you were to tell it now, uh, Michael, you'd have to think of your own personal bit because you weren't at yes. the Rio Olympics. You didn't see no. the Japanese. Um, no. So, but I'm sure you know you, you'd think of something uh, something similar. Um, yeah. And so another another uh, way that, that so I, I was I've had this story for a long time. I, I was reading an article in the Times is about three years ago, four years ago, and they talked about something. Uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of the of the space program, the Apollo program. And they talked about yes. uh, something similar, uh, which the Europeans put together, called the Europa rocket in 1970. Mm. I've already heard of the Europa rocket. Um, so uh, it was uh, the, 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 the lower stage was the British uh, missile. Then there was a French uh, stage and then a West German stage at the top. And the right. payload was provided by the Italians, the satellite. And it, the software was done was Belgian. And it was all launched in Australia. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so when you think about the great rocket successes like the Saturn V, which was launched 14 times perfectly, and then this Europa rocket, which uh, you never really heard of, right? Because it blew up basically no. every time, right? So, and why did it blew up every time? Because all the pieces didn't quite fit together, right? And so it wasn't properly mm. integrated. Uh, 
Um, and so, oh, I see. So the, the outcome, the, the, the message you're getting across is, you know, business process needs to be properly integrated. Yes. It's exactly the same message, but the metaphor this time is different. Um, and so this time I, I have to give a bit more background about this. It takes a bit longer to explain because- No, you know, sure. This. You may be familiar with a relay race, I admit that. But, oh, okay. But sometimes people want to learn, depends on, on who you are and how much time you have, so, but some, yes. some cultures, they, they don't like the idea of stories are entertainment. They like stories are where you learn things. And so yeah. if you spend a bit more time about the space program and why it's successful, why not? And this is that, and you're, oh, you're learning. This is kind of interesting. Oh, oh, I didn't know about that. And, and suddenly you, you're consuming information. And so the story is received as, oh, that's a piece yeah. of information. Um, so I can learn that way. Um, so sometimes that, that can be a different way. Of thinking about it and lastly we'll say well, james what's the what's the personal uh angle here well you read the story in the times well okay that's not that great so what i did was i went back and because it, it was vaguely triggered a message and when i was a boy um we used to have tea cards right so in your in your british tea uh brook bomb they oh, yes. card um that's uh, right americans yeah. had a similar one with cigarettes um so you but you would collect them and you stick them in an album because in the 1970s that was sort of the equivalent of the panini sticker book um, anyway, in 1973 or something, they had a series called The Race into Space. Um, and I thought, I've got that somewhere. So I went to my mother and said, do I still have that? Oh, yeah, I kept all your old stuff. And so I found it. And guess what? You know, sticker number 37 or something, that's the Europa rocket. Oh, wow. um, and so now when I tell the story, I get it out and hold up the camera and say, see, see this? This is the book I had when I was a boy. Let me tell you about this. <laughs> and so I found a way to, to make it uh, be personal. Um, yeah. And people like the idea of a little boy sticking in the tea cards. That's kind of a fun, or we did something similar, or I never heard of that before. Yes. Like, so people who are younger say, oh, it's like panini. I, I sort of relate to it that way. And it's because it's British mm. tea. It's kind of funny. And then the point is, let me tell you about this rocket because you've never heard of it. So you are uh, wrapping the metaphor. So now it's got what I think are the key elements, which is uh, a way to change the atmosphere, hold something up to the screen, way to make it personal. This is my little book when I collected it as a boy. Uh, I explain the rocket and then the aha moment. Oh, it's about integration. So those are sort of the key elements of a metaphor in business. Yeah. Yeah, I it's it's incredible because I always when when I talk about what happens in the brain mm -hmm. when stories are being told, we already have a set of neurons that when you were telling the rocket story, knows what a rocket looks like, number one. We also know Belgium and Italy and Australia and France and Britain and whatever. We know those countries as well. We can always... No, by the way, by the way, notice how when you say West Germany, it immediately dates it. So I always yeah. make sure I say West Germany. Oh, yeah, this time a long time ago. Yes, yes. Uh, so we, we already have neurons that have that knowledge so when you've just put that europa rocket into my brain it just fires the other neurons that already exist and puts the europa rocket with it and now there is a whole neural network around the europa rocket attached to all of these other elements the other thing that came up in my head. You don't have to use this when you next tell the story, but is I saw a Lego rocket and I saw a Lego rocket that didn't fit together proper, properly, that wasn't integrated. You know how sometimes the pieces just yeah. don't fit on Lego and you kind of go, why is this not coming together? And that's why it's, you know, didn't work or exploded or whatever happened to it. So what, what I'm trying to demonstrate there, really, because I'm, I'm listening, but at the same time, my yeah. brain is doing stuff as well at the same time. It's almost, 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 you're almost imagining how you could retell it or reuse it or repurpose it. And that's great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're always searching for how to make sense of it and how to remember it ourselves. Yes. The how to remember put it in is, with is, our own filters and our own knowledge around it. It's, it's often say to people, well, we, we know this is an old one, but well, without saying, you know, if you said the word aeroplane, what do you see? And everybody sees something totally differently. Mm -hmm. um, 
So even when we're hearing stories, we're interpreting it through our own filters and ideas and knowledge and experiences and make something different out of it. That's why, because we're working, our brain is working. If we get a PowerPoint presentation, our brain doesn't work. It just kind right. of looks, you know, and forgets. Uh, whereas when you hear a story, you, you're going to remember it. So, yeah, I, I, so metaphors, I'm a big fan of metaphor. I don't use it enough, I think. Um, but I think it's a natural way of speaking. So even our language, I mean, we have metaphors like, I don't know, we see a lot of water, you say, oh, it's a raging torrent. That's like, mm. well, raging is a metaphor. Right? Yes. Or so I'm going to be angry. But everyone uses yes. that. Sometimes they're, they're so common. Or yes. That we, we don't, you know, or a cast iron alibi. Well, mm. that's a met these are all metaphors because okay, they've yes. been around a long time they see they seem to have always lost their power completely but they are all metaphors and so mm. language is really about about metaphor and when you said lego there that's, that's interesting I've, I've tried or thought about having a story around lego uh, for some time and now you've given me an idea which is that you know that i work for a company our, our software is you know more expensive than the competition oftentimes and maybe mm. i should go out and get some some Lego blocks, and then the cheaper knockoff blocks that don't quite fit together quite as well. And yes. I take them into a meeting and say, see these two things here? This is only one third, is only one third of the price of this. But you know what? It doesn't quite fit. Looks okay. When you yes. try to put to tower, it doesn't, it's not as strong. Whereas this is probably made. Guess what? Our stuff's more expensive than his one. So that's a, something I could, you know, now you've given me an idea of something that will be tactile, it will be fun, and we yes. can maybe ask people to try, try to build something with these different things. Um, so that would be, that's a, a, a one thing. And then the other thing that triggered my mind there is when you said, what, when you see an airplane, what do you think of? Mm. Uh, and I think of that iconic picture of the Wright brothers, uh, the very first flight. And you probably know yes. this black and white picture, and there's a guy with his hands up in the air, right? And that, was, that first flight was only like 10 seconds long. But the story that's not on the story is the guy who took the photograph. He had never seen a camera before in his life. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't even know what a camera was. He'd never seen a photograph before in his life. And this no. is, so, and they, they are trusting probably the most iconic photograph of the entire 20th century to a guy yes. who's never seen a camera before, doesn't even know what a photograph is. And oh, he no, took no. it, but the only six seconds they were off the ground, he got it. He got all the, the other guy waving at it. And it's become an absolutely iconic photograph. So the idea that, you know, beginners can never can never succeed. Hey, look at this guy! Right, the most famous yeah. photograph taken uh, was taken yeah. by someone who'd never seen a camera before. Incredible, incredible. So, um, one one thing I came across a few years ago in connection with metaphors, which you 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 may know, uh, I didn't at the time, and I still struggle to get my head around it. Is metonymies? Have you come across metonymies? Uh, you know, I, I saw you mentioned Greek, so I should be able to figure out what a metonymy is, but I don't know what it is. Explain to me, Michael. I, I don't know what it's translated, but it's a type of metaphor. Okay. So it's a type of metaphor. So, for example, um, I'll try and paint a, a, a picture of a, think of a Boddington's beer mm -hmm. in a pint glass, and it's got a white head on the top of it. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the foam head on the top of it has been combed with a comb in, into a quiff and the combs yep. and the combs lying next to the pint. And that's what, that's all you're getting. You're getting a photograph okay. with the, with the quiff and you see the comb marks in the quiff, which is the foam on top of the beer kind of quite okay. high up and uh, the comb lying next to the pine glass and they i learned this from at birmingham university i went to some talk which was talking about language in business and they were talking about multimodal metaf metaphors in advertising it was called okay. a project called emma where they did a lot of research around the world and they used a number of countries japan i think was one of them spain britain and one other country, I can't remember, Mexico, maybe. Uh, and they tried these things out, different types of adverts and what people got from it. Basically, the essence of metonymies are that you present something to somebody and they've got to work it out. 
So the metaphor oh, okay. like a isn't riddle, like, maybe. yeah, it's a bit of a riddle, but all of the information is in it. And it by making your brain work harder, you will remember it for longer. Got it. Yeah. So very, very powerful. I like that. I like that. So this goes into how much should you spoon feed people and how much should you let them try to join the dots? So I do this when I do the metaphors. And after I've done one, I, I say, OK, so why am I telling the story? And when I'm teaching class, it's always difficult not to interrupt yourself. Right? But I try to shut up. And yes, as I call golden silence, which is to make the silence longer than you're comfortable with. Um, yeah. Until somebody tries to you know, figure it out. And uh, because somebody, as this is a growth mindset idea, because he just figured it out, maybe I could have figured it out too. Rather than if, I, if the guy at the front gives me all the information, this is obviously really hard. That's why I'm in class to learn this stuff. But if everyone else is figuring this out, maybe I could too. So I like that idea of um, yes. you know, letting people work a little harder than they may be comfortable with to, to understand uh, the story. I mean, we do this uh, you know, when, we, when we, I'm a big fan of crossword puzzles, right? We, we, we always try to, we, you know, when a crossword puzzle setter is how much should you give them and how, how big a gap is it for them to try to solve? And that's same is true yeah. with the other jokes or riddles or anything. So that's interesting. Yeah. I've met him. But you notice I, I taking notes here. And, uh, yeah, yeah, tip, brilliant. Another, another, another tip is uh, take notes visually on the screen, right? So if you if someone's saying something, I could see when I reach my book, you smile a little bit. Oh, he's, he's writing this down. He must like it. So, <laughs> so it, it's you know, part of the of the visual cue of being remote is every so often, you know, visually take a few notes. Uh, that yes. people people think, oh, he's, uh, so if someone asks you a question, hang on a moment, let me just let me jot that down. They're, they're more likely to understand that you are taking their note and uh, say, let me follow up with that. Just go back like a moment and, and you know, make a big deal of picking up the pen. Um, I think, again, people like to know that what they've said was important enough to write in, in my special notebook, which is, you know, even got on it with my daughter, this one. It's got, you know, my oh, name. On it. brilliant. Yeah, I just got I this. It. It's just a nice little thing on the front. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Oh, so, um, amazing. You know, so it's, it's now you're in my my best notebook. Um, so you feel, <laughs> and I'm going to go back and look up and learn, learn more about metonymy. So that's uh, well, thanks for sharing. I'll, I'll send you a video clip that I did on it as well. Okay, um, cool. It's it's a little bit too long, but but don't tell me everything because I want I want to learn it myself. Then it'll be more yes. impactful. If you don't don't speak. Yes. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't. So so um, okay, we're we're going to wrap up in a minute. But I've got a burning question. A couple of burning questions. Mm -hmm. Is there something that I haven't teased out of you that you wanted to share today? What do you? Um, so I, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, this idea that, you know, we're all storytellers, but mm. most of us have forgotten how. Uh, that's sort of one thing. It's not a new skill that you've got to learn. It's an old skill you have to, you know, just re rediscover, I think is important. Yes. That, that makes these, these skills seem more attainable. Yeah. And then the other, the other thing I was saying is, you know, storytelling is the only way to transmit deep truths. If you have something important uh, in your life, or in your business that you want to communicate, then wrapping it up, in a story uh, or metaphor, is the way that you'll uh, communicate the information and more, most critically get it to be passed on to be in the room where it happens to be to have it be passed on and as, as you know, added to uh, refined and so on so it's it, it has more uh, more per persuasive power love that love that james the second burning question is tell us about the hat yeah, so um, I started wearing hats a few years ago, maybe five years ago, and I decided that it was, uh, uh, I like wearing them. I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fashion guy, but it's something that, you know, you can get into comparatively easy. Um, they're not that expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. You can learn new hat makers and new distributors and so on. But also it's a, it's a bit of a branding thing. Uh, it's hard sometimes to stick out in a company of 100,000 people. Uh, yes. So uh, I'm the hat guy. Um, so brilliant. One one use case is uh, you know at my company we have a convention with literally ten thousand people, mm. um, and when people say oh, I'll see you at, at that event, um, you know most of the time they you don't see them because there's too many people. But I'm the only one wearing a hat, so I can easily do that. Um, so that has that bonus uh, as well. So brilliant. So it's a, it. it's a a branding thing and it has a has a, a, a use as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's brilliant. And because I saw a, a different video that you were in and you had a different color hat on. Oh, I've got a lot of these. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's in fact, fantastic. you can see on on the picture behind me. There's uh, on the side of it. There's one of the yes, on the, on yes. the thing there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, then, I, yeah. I remember my dad uh, in Amsterdam a few years back. Now um, he always used to wear a hat to work, and um, a very similar looking type hat that you're wearing. And so it took me. He probably wore the grey one that's on the bookshelf. Okay. Behind you, and. Yeah, it just took me straight back to seeing him wearing the hat. I think it's different and yeah, definitely stands out. So yeah, well done. All right. So James, how can people connect with you? Where's the best place for them to go and look you up? Well, uh, so LinkedIn and Twitter are my main uh, channels. Uh, so uh, my name is James Marlin. I work for SAP. You'll find me on LinkedIn pretty easily. So happy to connect there. And on Twitter, uh, at sign James Marland, uh, the same my full name, uh, as you see on the screen there. Um, so easy to find there. Um, so I generally use Twitter for more casual communications uh, and reaching out to anybody and LinkedIn slightly for more business focused conversations. I'm happy to connect on either. Brilliant. And and where are you based now? Where where in the world are you? No, I'm based in London. Uh, London. So uh, although I, I used to do uh, quite a lot of traveling. Um, so like a lot of people <laughs> was rethinking what that means in, in my company. Yes. So, um, so obviously, you know, a lot of remote work. Um, uh, like yourself, where trying to um, you, you make best use of remote presence uh, using technologies like Zoom or yes. remote, remote whiteboarding or podcasts or whatever. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, James, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing all your, your wisdom, your story, and how you're making use of it. It's brilliant. Thanks so much. Super. Well, thanks for inviting me. Cheers, everyone. Okay. Take care. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.